Canton Confidential, the Karen Reed murder trial, starts right now. A significant development in the Karen Reed murder investigation. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Glenn Jones. I'm J.C. Monahan. State Trooper Michael Proctor, the lead investigator in the case, has been relieved of duty. It was a move we learned about late last night, just hours after Judge Beverly Canoni declared a mistrial. State police say this follows a previous decision to open an internal affairs investigation after information emerged about Trooper Proctor's misconduct. And part of that misconduct was on display during his testimony. Proctor read a series of vulgar texts he sent to friends and colleagues about Karen Reed. He said on the stand his words were, quote, unprofessional and regrettable, but claimed they had no bearing on the integrity of the investigation. Proctor is still employed. He's been transferred to a unit in South Boston, but he can no longer work on cases or function as a trooper. Last night, we showed you this exclusive video of Michael Proctor. Our NBC10 Boston investigators went to his home after the mistrial had been declared. Proctor did not comment on the investigation nor the decision from state police. And now the NBC10 investigators are taking a closer look at what this means for Proctor and Massachusetts state police. Governor Maura Healey is also weighing in. Kathy Curran has more. Proctor has been relieved of his duties while the internal investigation into his conduct continues. That means he's not actively working. He's still a member of the department and getting paid, but that could very well change. A misconduct in any way, shape or form in the Massachusetts State Police will not be tolerated. Massachusetts State Police Colonel Jack Mon taking a strong stance against the actions of Trooper Michael Proctor during his investigation of Karen Reed, who's accused of hitting her former boyfriend, John O'Keefe, with her car and killing him. Proctor sent vulgar and demeaning texts about Reed to his family, friends and fellow troopers. She's a whack job. See I condemn those comments in the strongest terms possible. Testimony revealed the detective was also familiar with several of the witnesses. The case ended in a mistrial and for this trooper, a fall from grace. Trooper Proctor, Kathy Curran from NBC10. We'd like to ask you some questions. Do you, do you think your actions impacted the outcome of the trial? I'm not on your lawn, I'm on the street. Proctor graduated from the State Police Academy in 2014 and moved on to work as a detective in the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office. Last year, he was paid $146,000, almost $37,000 in overtime. But Proctor's fate with the department will be determined by an internal investigation and the state's post commission, which oversees police misconduct. Sources tell us Proctor is also part of a federal probe looking into the handling of the Reed case. Should he be fired? This is the right move to remove him. There is a process, so we have to wait for that process to, to, uh, to go forward. Proctor's behavior, the latest of a long trail of scandals within Massachusetts State Police, eroding public trust. Troopers accused of taking bribes for commercial driver's licenses. Others convicted of stealing overtime for shifts they never worked, and many more. Colonel, how, how, can, how can you earn the public's trust when it just seems like there's scandal after scandal after scandal? We need to work very hard uh, to engage the public in a more meaningful way so that we can understand what it is that we need to do and, we, and where we want to go in order to uh, maintain trust, build trust, and in some cases regain it. And we asked about any action being taken against Proctor's supervisors. The colonel said they're continuing to investigate. Trooper Proctor will have a hearing to determine his work status during the internal affairs investigation. His car, gun, and gear have been taken away, which is standard practice. We reached out to Proctor's lawyer, but never heard back. For Canton Confidential, I'm Kathy Curran. JC and Glenn, back to you. Kathy, thank you. And this afternoon, the union representing the state police released a statement about the trial and Trooper Proctor. It reads, in part, it is our understanding that this discipline came as a result of the troopers' private text message exchanges that were made public during the trial. We also understand that it has no relationship to salacious allegations of cover-ups, collusion, or conspiracies offered by the defense. It goes on to say, quote, we must be clear that we do not condone the language used in text messages presented as evidence during the trial. We're joined tonight by Todd McGee, security and law enforcement expert. He's also a retired Massachusetts state trooper. Todd, thank you so much for being with us. What is your reaction to Trooper Proctor being relieved of his duty? Well, we saw the state police take swift action after the 
uh, well, after the mistrial declaration by uh, Judge Canoni. Uh, not surprising. Uh, we understood that there was the uh, state police internal affairs investigation. And based on those findings, the investigators will send that information uh, over for a duty status hearing. So this is about the place that we're at right now. And then based on uh, the recommendation of the trial board, uh, they will make a re recommendation to Colonel Mon. And from there, the the discipline could be anywhere if it's a class A violation. It could be anywhere from 30 days of suspension all the way up to termination. Colonel Mon said, Todd, that uh, he's constructing a plan to maintain build and, if necessary, regain the public trust in his organization. What's your sense of the potential damage done by Trooper Proctor's conduct? And is that damage repairable, in your view? The damage is considerable. And we can see where the impact was, specifically with, with the Karen Reed trial. But we don't know about the other trials that he's been a part of in the investigation. Uh, the other high-profile uh, case, of course, is the um, Brian Walsh uh, uh, trial. So uh, trials like that, we will have to wait to see what the the outcome will be. Each and every case has a different factors, different evidence, and we can only hope that there was um, the utmost of integrity that was uh, performed within those investigations. But right now, um, that remains to be seen. Todd, we want to get to a question from one of our viewers. Kevin writes in, with Trooper Proctor being suspended from the Mass State Police, can the Commonwealth still call him in the second trial? What do you think? The Commonwealth can call him based on his, his involvement in the first trial. But I think it's important to understand that the Post Commission is the state agency that will submit police officers that have exhibited some misconduct to the Brady list. The Brady list is for all government officials, not just law enforcement, as a as an accountability uh, list of accountability. So um, in this particular case, if uh, Trooper Proctor ends up on the Brady list, essentially any testimony that he has in, in the court, court of law is, is basically useless, to, to be frank. Wow. Well, when you're uh, answering a question from JC a couple of minutes ago, you talked about his union-protected due process that is underway right now. I'm just wondering, does he protect his self-interest if he resigns on the belief that he will ultimately be fired? That's been a, a practice within law enforcement. I've seen it within the state police. I think now with post commission, some changes in guidelines where basically police officers are licensed as opposed to the oath of office. Uh, I don't see in this particular case, especially for a number of reasons, you've had the governor, Governor Haley, weigh in on, on this case, uh, specifically about Trooper Proctor's conduct, as well as being a high profile case. The world is watching, literally the world is watching how this case plays out. So I believe there's going to be very, very little uh, um, options that are available other than what the trial board and the the duty status hearing will will um, will yield with results. All right, Todd McGee, retired Massachusetts State Trooper. We always appreciate having you on. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. When thank we you, come JC, back, thank you. thank you. We are live in Dedham with what comes next following the mistrial. And a little later, we're answering more of your questions with Catherine Loftus. We'll be right back. Take a look at this view. Our drone was over the courthouse in Denham as hundreds of people came out yesterday to, mark, to make their presence known. A sea of people, some of whom have been invested in this saga for years. So where do we go from here? The Norfolk County District Attorney's Office says it is planning to retry the Karen Reed case. In fact, there's already a hearing set for later this month to map out a plan. So that left us wondering what a second trial would look like. Our Kirsten Glavin has been covering this trial for us since the beginning. She's live outside Norfolk County Superior Court in Dedham. Kirsten. At Glenn JC, we've been speaking with legal experts all day, and they say we can expect to see this case retried sometime within the next year. All eyes on what's next as the first Karen Reed murder trial comes to a close with a retrial now on the horizon. I've been observing criminal cases in Massachusetts uh, for decades now, and I have never seen a case 
that had this much public interest. It doesn't die down. Law experts agreeing that two things will remain high public interest in the case and costs. The costs and expenses of that just has to be absolutely through the roof. I have no inside knowledge and can't even speculate what it costs. But as I said, it's uh, got to be up there in the stratosphere. Lead investigator, Massachusetts State Police Trooper Michael Proctor, officially relieved of his duty just hours after the mistrial. But would he testify okay. again? Experts say it's likely he would. I think somebody will put him on the stand in the second trial unless he, unless he asserts a Fifth Amendment right, even if he's completely fired by that point, which I anticipate he won't. I think the state police can't afford not to. State prosecutors also likely to have a tighter, cleaner case, knowing exactly what to expect from Reed's defense with time to prepare. It's also possible that they would reevaluate, reassess which charges they bring the second time. I can see, for example, maybe uh, them deciding not to go forward with the second degree murder, just the other two charges, if they thought that would help their chances of getting a conviction or make it an easier, cleaner trial. Now, there is a status hearing scheduled for July 22nd when both the prosecution and the defense will meet with the judge to go over schedules and we'll get a better idea of when things could happen. JC, Glenn. All right, Kirsten, thank you for your tireless reporting tonight and for the last few months. We're answering your questions on a possible Karen Reed retrial. Coming up, an NBC 10 exclusive. We are hearing from a friend of John O'Keefe who knew him for more than 20 years. What he has to say about the mistrial. We're joined now by local attorney Catherine Loftus, also known on TikTok for Note My Objection, which if you haven't seen yet, you need to Google. Hi, Catherine. We're trying not to be too disappointed you're not here in person with us. We're going to start with a multi-part. <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't join you guys in person tonight. <laughs> We're going to start with a multi-part question from our viewer, Michelle. Her question is regarding the parallel federal investigation. She wants to know, will we ever hear an outcome of this investigation? If something illegal corrupt is found to have taken place, will this be presented to future jurors in the next trial? And finally, could the outcome of this federal investigation change the state's decision to retry Karen Reed? What do you think, Catherine? I think it's unlikely we will see anything substantively different um, this time around. If anything were to come from the federal investigation, if we were to have indictments against any of the parties, any of the witnesses, any of the troopers, that certainly could come into play uh, with the Commonwealth deciding whether to not move forward or not. I think at this point, we're about two years into the federal grand jury investigation. We don't know whether it's still ongoing. We don't know whether it's closed. So unless and until we actually have a conclusion from them, which would be via an indictment, I think it's unlikely to change anything procedurally with the Commonwealth's case. All right, Catherine, this one's from Chris, who asks, how come some juries have to be unanimous, but others only need a majority? So in a criminal case, in order to find somebody guilty or not guilty, you need unanimous. That's both in district court, which is six in Massachusetts, as well as superior court, which is 12. Um, and that is because we our protections for defendants um, are heightened. And obviously, uh, we want to make sure that that burden, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, is agreed to by all 12 jurors. So as in this case, sometimes when you have two different theories and uh, of jurors who are just seemingly as entrenched in the different sides as the public is, it becomes difficult sometimes to get a unanimous verdict. We've got another one here from Thomas. He wants to know, can the defense use transcripts and other data obtained in the first trial for the retrial? They can. So uh, what will happen when we uh, come on July 22nd, we'll find out when um, we're going to try the case next. That'll be dependent on uh, counsel's schedules as well as the court. But another thing is that they're going to want to get all of the transcripts from this uh, first trial and it will be voluminous. They'll need to go through all of those transcripts. And those will are what we could use um, for what we call impeachment material. So say one witness testified, if there is something that sounds inconsistent with what their previous testimony is, counsel can use that prior testimony from the first trial to uh, attempt to impeach their credibility. So it absolutely can and will be used. Could that actually be then a third trial because we have the grand jury and then the trial and then if we had a second trial, you'd have two statements to go back on. Is that right? Am I following so that? 
You're correct. Even more. So in theory, we would have the state grand jury testimony. We'd have the federal grand jury testimony. We'd have the first trial testimony. And then we would have the current testimony. So theoretically, we have three sets of impeachment material for each witness. So Whoa. <laughs> it, it can get hefty. <laughs> you know, Catherine, I've been wanting to ask you something that I asked Michael Coyne yesterday. And it is about the pretrial publicity, the social media rancor all of those things that surrounded this trial that, I don't know, I wonder if you worry someone's going to try to repeat that same noise and energy around the trial in order to try to force some kind of specific outcome. Is that something we need to guard against, especially when we look for impartial jurors to come in and do their service? It's funny. I was actually talking with my dad today, the other loftus, about this very issue, about how things have changed over time, and that it used to be very rare that you would get an insight, and specifically the public would really get a, a hands-on view into what a jury trial looked like. And now we've sort of gone to the complete opposite end, where we see everything and anything. And while it's Definitely a good thing because we want um, the citizens in, of the United States and our Commonwealth to be able to have access to what's happening in the criminal justice system. It does complicate things a bit because it brings a lot of outside, not only um, scrutiny, but a lot of people who are evaluating the case in ways that might be difficult to understand if you're not uh, an attorney or used to the system. So I, I think there's definitely pros and cons, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot more of this moving forward. We saw it with the Murdoch case. We see it with this case. So I, I would expect to see more of it, not less. Catherine, I want to squeeze in one more question before we let you go. It's from Deb. What yeah. happens to all the notes the jury kept during the trial? We talked about the notes so Good much. Question. Do they take them home? No, they don't take them home. They stay with the... They, so basically, when there's a trial in the court, everything gets stored stored within the courthouse. And particularly because this is a, a mistrial, um, everything basically stays, all the, um, uh, all the uh, notes, anything like that, all the uh, marked exhibits that the stenographer had to go through one by one by one, those stay within the courthouse, uh, within the court file. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that means all their doodles when they were bored. That's, That's all right. going in there, too. That's right. Catherine Loftus, thank you. Happy Fourth, Catherine. Thank you. Happy Fourth. Still ahead, we're speaking exclusively to a close friend of John O'Keefe. His reaction next. And by the way, we are not done with Canton Confidential. We are going to bring you episodes all this week. So please email us any questions to canton.confidential at nbcuni.com. And you may have it answered right here by one of our experts. We'll be right back. Before we go tonight, we want to focus on the victim, John O'Keefe. His family and friends are undoubtedly the ones who have felt the deepest impact of his death. We saw some of that emotion throughout his trial. This mistrial means that they are left without a sense of closure. Our John Maroney spoke exclusively to a longtime friend of O'Keefe and brings us his reaction. It's hard to put it into to a short interview like this, but he was a tremendous man. Uh, I met him in college. Uh, best friend in college, you know, we did everything together. John Jackson is thinking a lot lately about his friend John O'Keefe. He says he's not looking forward to the prospects of a second trial for Karen Reed. The worst part about this is is for the O'Keefe's, really. You know, um, you just feel so bad. You, just feel, you know, you, you don't want to see them go through it again. It was, uh, it was devastating. Jackson says he's known the O'Keefe family for years and says they're being treated unfairly especially online. Stop. Stop talking about the O'Keefe's in a negative way. Pray for them. Support them. Do what you can for the O'Keefe family. They just, they don't deserve this. Jackson says O'Keefe was godfather to his now 16-year-old daughter. The former Boston police officer also raised his niece and nephew after his sister and brother-in-law passed away. It didn't surprise us at all, um, but it certainly changed his life in, in, in a lot of great ways. So those, those kids are amazing. Jackson owns a ball cap with his friend's badge number. He says he watched the entire trial and can't understand how people can ignore the evidence. Stories made up by, you know, Karen and the defense team, the defense attorneys made up a story and people are listening to these defense attorneys like, like whatever they say is gospel. It's their defense attorneys. Like they're selling you a story. That's, the, that's their job. And these people bought it. John Jackson does know Karen Reed. I asked him about his impressions of her. He declined to comment. 
In Dedham, John Maroney, NBC10 Boston. John, thank you. That's it for us tonight here on Canton Confidential, but you're not done with us yet. There's so much more still to discuss. We'll be back here tomorrow night at 7, answering your questions and digging deeper into what comes next. We have complete coverage of the Karen Reed murder trial on our website, NBC10Boston.com. And if you scan that QR code on your screen, you can be brought right to our Canton Confidential page. We appreciate all of you tuning in, and we hope you have a good night.